The Standard Penetration Test, commonly referred to as the SPT, was developed in the early 1900s as a method of sampling sands. It wasn't until the late 1940s that it was developed into a test and then became commonly used in all materials. Today, the test has a dedicated standard that dictates how it should be carried out. BSENISO 22476 Part 3 This video will examine what the standard dictates in terms of equipment, calibration, maintenance, pre-test checks, the test procedure, as well as the reporting requirements. Firstly, we will look at the equipment used. The SPT requires a 63.5 kg weight to be dropped over a 760 mm height onto an anvil. Although the weight that is dropped must be 63.5 kg, the entire SPT assembly should not weigh more than 115 kg. The SPT can be taken using a variety of drilling machines, however, there are two different types of equipment which are commonly used in the UK. The first of these is the automatic trip hammer, more commonly referred to as a standard drop hammer. This hammer uses the rope and winch of either a cable percussion or rotary drilling machine. The hammer is positioned vertically above the drill string and the movable weight is lifted to around 760 mm whereby it is automatically tripped and the weight drops to make contact with the anvil and drive the drill string into the borehole below. The second is the hydraulic hammer, more commonly found on rotary and dynamic sampling machines. This method uses a chain-driven mechanism. The mechanism lifts the weight to the height required, where it is then dropped. In addition to a hammer, the SPT must be carried out using the correct size of drill rod. The rods must not exceed 10 kilograms per meter in weight, and the ideal rod is a B-sized rod of around 50 millimeters diameter. Larger diameter rods, such as NWY and 2 and 3 8 may be acceptable but the weight must be checked to ensure they comply with the relevant standard. HWY rods and larger are generally non-compliant. Where SPTs are specified, the results will be used to help define the ground's material characteristics. These characteristics are then taken into account when designing structures and foundations. As with all equipment, it is very important that the SPT hammer being used is checked to ensure it is safe to use, used correctly, and is well maintained. Hydraulic hammers should be inspected as part of the daily machine pre-use check. When an automatic hammer is used, these should be included as part of the daily machine and equipment inspection scheme. Automatic hammers should only be lifted when the designated lifting pin, supplied by the manufacturer, is in place. This lifting pin secures the anvil to the sleeve. Chains and hooks should never be used to secure the anvil to the sleeve. The anvil must be fitted with a manufacturer's approved roll or cell lock pin with rubber dampeners in place either side of the cell lock pin. The lifting sleeve must have a minimum of two working claws or pawls, although the three claw system is more reliable and preferred by many drillers. The hammer should be used dry or with a spray of light oil. Grease or heavy oil should not be used to lubricate the hammer's shaft as it tends to thicken with use and slow down the hammer, thus compromising the efficiency of the hammer. As the equipment wears, or when it is poorly maintained, the tripping mechanism can become dry, worn or damaged, 
and there is a temptation to attach a rope or chain to help the support operative pull the sleeve back down. Any SPT equipment in this condition should not be used and should be replaced or immediately refurbished before using again. The test results can be affected by many variables, including poorly maintained equipment, skill of the driller, and also the straightness and verticality of the test string. In order to achieve more consistent, reliable results, a centralizer at the top of the casing, or closing the top clamps of a rotary drilling machine, can help to keep the rod centrally aligned within the borehole. This prevents side-to-side -side movement or wobbling of the drill string. The straightness of the rods should also be checked at least every 20 tests, and this can be done by simply rolling along a flat surface, rolling across the trestles, or spinning the rod when hanging from the swivel. This rod straightness check should then be documented in the driller's inspection or maintenance records, or on the driller's logs. Any bent rods must not be used. To carry out and record the test correctly, check the specified depth of the test and ensure the borehole is clean to that depth. Next, Record the actual depth of the borehole by dipping or measuring using a tape. Record the depth of the casing and measure and record the water level using a dip meter or record if the borehole is dry. Carefully lower the test string to the base of the borehole, adding rods as necessary until you have at least 450 millimeters above the datum point which is normally the top of the casing, centralizer, or top of the clamps. Ensure the rods are measured and counted as they are attached to the drill string. This is to ensure that the actual depth of the borehole corresponds to the depth when dipped prior to the test. Mark the rods above the datum point with six 75mm increments, the first two 75mm increments are called the seating drive, and the four remaining 75mm increments are called the main or test drive. Drillers may use a tape measure or measuring stick and chalk to physically mark the rods. On dynamic sampling machines, some drillers mark the rods, some mark the mast, while others have a movable magnetic measuring stick which is put on the mast. If using an automatic hammer, lift and gently lower it to the top of the test string. Remove the locking screw or pin and screw the hammer fully onto the test string whilst providing some slack in the winch rope. If using a dynamic sampling machine or rotary drilling machine with a hydraulic hammer, Attach the hammer onto the drive dolly and, depending on the machine, lower the lifting ram. If, during adding the hammer to the test rods, the test string sinks under its own weight, the penetration must be measured and recorded on the drilling log as self-weight penetration, SW. If self-weight penetration is observed, the markings on the rods will need to be removed and the test string remarked above the datum point. Once marked up, the test is started. First, the seating drive is carried out. Record the number of blows for each of the first two 75mm increments. Refusal of the seating drive is recorded if a total of 25 blows fails to achieve the full 150mm penetration. If the seating drive meets refusal, measure and record the depth that has successfully been penetrated. If the seating drive refuses, 
then the rods will need to be remarked with four 75mm main drive increments from where the seating drive stopped. Once the seating drive is complete, the test is then driven for a further four 75mm increments, and the number of blows for each increment is then recorded. If the test is driven the full 300mm, then the blows for each increment are added up to obtain the N value. Refusal of the main drive occurs if a total of 50 blows fails to achieve the full 300mm penetration. If refusal is met, then similar to the seating drive, the depth penetrated is recorded, however no N value is recorded. In some strong materials, the hammer may bounce on impact. Should bouncing occur, as shown here, the test should be terminated immediately. The depth penetrated should be measured and the refusal noted as bouncing. Again, no N value is recorded in this scenario. At the end of the test, the hammer should be unscrewed from the rods, the locking pin replaced on automatic hammers, before lifting the hammer off the test string and storing safely. The test string can now be removed from the borehole using the winch, in the case of a CP machine, the drill head of a rotary machine, or hydraulic extruder with manufacturer's approved clamping devices on the dynamic sampling machine. When conducting the test in sands, silts and clays, SPT split spoons with cutting shoes should be used. However, when in gravels or materials which have gravel particles, or in rock, a 60 degree cone should be used instead. If the SPT shoe or cone is worn or damaged, then it should be replaced before carrying out the test. When a split spoon is used, a small disturbed sample, a D sample, is obtained. This should then be placed into a tub or jar and correctly labelled. The driller's log or data collection program must have boxes to allow the driller to recall all of the following information. Test depth, top and bottom. Self-weight penetration. Number of blows per increment. Penetration achieved for each or all blows. The N value. Casing depth. And water level. The test should be recorded for the actual depth penetrated and, if a sample has been recovered in the split spoon, then this should be recorded as a separate small disturbed sample over the depth range of the test. Each record for each test should be complete with zeros recorded where no blows were required to achieve penetration and dashes or blanks used where the increment was not required due to early refusal. SPT equipment used to obtain N values for design purposes must have the energy ratio of the hammer determined and an energy ratio report, often called an SPT calibration report, must be completed as a minimum every 12 months. Hammers which display erratic or inconsistent energy per blow during this calibration or have measurements lower than 60% indicate a poorly operating or badly maintained hammer. The hammer should be re-inspected to ensure it is within tolerance for the specified drop height and weight. The straightness of the inner shaft and or the trip release mechanism, pickup bush, pulls, and trip sleeve must also be checked to ensure they operate correctly. In the case of an erratic or inconsistent hydraulic hammer, the flow rates must be checked to determine that they are correct. The current energy ratio of the hammer being used for the test 
must also be known and recorded on the drilling log. You should now have a good understanding of how to complete a standard penetration test. For any further information or guidance, please get in touch via the methods displayed here. Good luck, and thank you for watching.